Do. Then go, thank you. Thank you. You know, there's two things I've learned in shooting this episode. And number one is this. Don't borrow a car from someone who says, yeah, it drives okay, except it may need a tune. Especially, especially when you have the money for a rental car. And number two, don't get lost in Alaska when your cell phone loses service and you're driving a car that needs a tune. Well, other than that, losing my luggage. My trip to this, the 49th state on its 50th anniversary, it was both surprising and predictable. I did expect to see incredible views in every direction, SUVs, log cabins, maybe an occasional moose. The way I imagined its towns and city pretty much matched the way it looked in my mind, including those Oh, well, summer markets and festivals where people meet and greet and sell their local goods. But I think what surprised me were the little things, like the flowers. They seemed to punch through the landscape everywhere, bursting forth, welcoming me, as well as the buzzing sound above of all those little airplanes flying in this short summer season. And then there was the fishing. Of course, yeah, you expect to see it, but unless you want to go pretty far out of town, let me just put it this way, you're not going to be lonely. Alaska. As every third grader knows, Alaska is the largest state in America. And if you try to sum it up in two minutes with a limited point of view, like I'm doing right now, well, you could invite the hostile reaction from the locals. Alaskans live in this rugged harmony with their majestic environment. The mountains, the glaciers, those lonely lakes and hidden streams everywhere. And it even seems that their dogs refuse any sort of pampered, citified treatment. Well, you could say at least most do. Hey, 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 this is Greg. I'm looking a little rough because I am in the wilds of Alaska. Thanks for joining me today on the Dog Soup. We're going to start off with a bunch of short clips, the first one being with a vocal coach with a lot of personality and her long hair chihuahua. Start growling at the TV and I'm like, what? It was Debbie Gibson with that round hat on. He doesn't like hats. Give me five. Give me five. Ow! His name is Don Juan DeMarco. So I thought he looked like Johnny Depp and Don Juan DeMarco. When I first got him, he had a stripe all the way from the tip of his nose down to the tip of his tail. And his tail didn't have all this fur. He grew, grew this later. I thought he looked like a chipmunk. Sunglasses drive him crazy. But once he gets to know you, he will love you to pieces. You are his. And he'll get upset if you don't acknowledge it when, he, when you walk in. When he's around other dogs, he goes right up to them and growls and barks and checks them out right away. And he is in charge no matter how big. But he sings along with my students. He plays piano. He sings on pitch. Are you going to be able to show me that? Puppy always out in the streets, almost getting run over by every three-wheeler, four-wheeler. Finally, I said to the little Eskimo kid next door, I said, hey, tie that dog up. Because it seemed to be hanging around their house, except nobody was feeding it. It was in the garbage. 
He said, oh, mister, that's a bum dog. Nobody wants that dog. That's not our dog, you know. And so I took it in. But it howls like a husky, but it's very intense in terms of, like, its focus. Mm -hmm. And um, it, I think it's got some, um, what do you call it, um, border collie in it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, she's very smart. Uh, one of the greatest dogs I've ever owned, really. She just loves fishing, though. You'd love what the dog does because the dog, when I get a fish hunt, will actually uh -huh. jump right in the water. And whoosh, like on the first jump and get him. Wow. Big Lake resident Becca Charles was a dog musher at one point who owned 100 sled dogs. And I said, well, how did you choose your favorite out of all those? And she really wouldn't tell me. But during the whole course of the time I spent with her there, it was fun, but there was something compelling and there was something just a little different about her. And so after the interview, she finally admitted to me that, yes, indeed, she was and had been a hippie. I'm originally from Massachusetts. And I moved up to Alaska about, oh, five years ago so that I could mush my sled dogs that I had in college. And ended up signing up for Iditarod, never completed it, um, uh, retired from dog mushing. And now I just live with my boy Chuck in Crosby and my husband Randy. So I got him at four weeks, very young, and I raised him with another litter of puppies that we had. And so basically, he, he came in the house more often, but he was basically a sled dog from his puppyhood. This is Crosby. He's just over a year old now. We got him around Thanksgiving of last year, and he's a boxer and kind of a wimp. Ended up coming up to Alaska on a whim, just wanted to come up and experience the real wilderness. Well, I lived on a glacier for one season with all my dogs um, and that was a blast so we got choppered up we'd stay up for about a week and then I'd go back down for a shower and you know some groceries and come back up the dogs would stay up there all season having the sled dogs was such an amazing experience I mean I literally had between 35 and over 100 dogs at one time I've gained 50 pounds since I stopped dog mushing and I only weigh like 145 right now when you have that many dogs you try not to have a favorite but you end up having them because you have those special lead dogs that have gotten you through those situations. For instance, one time I, uh, I was running a 300 mile race outside of Fairbanks and we got to the top of what's called Eagle Summit. And this is a year where you go down the steep side of Eagle Summit. When you're running sled dogs, they're not very controllable going downhill. And I lost my dog team and they just went barreling down the hill without me. And I called Woe twice and my lead dog Candic stopped the whole team on that downhill. Wow. And so she was definitely one of my favorites, I guess I have to break down and say it. But typically you treat everybody equally, like none of the dogs gets better treatment than the other because they can see that. Those dogs are doing so much for you and you have to do so much for them. It would be such a waste to have to go out and scoop poop every day and feed them every day and never get, and never get any... Um, enjoyment from it. Uh -huh. The bond that you make with those dogs is so far above and beyond any bond that you could ever make with with pets, even with me and Chuck. I mean, we're best friends, but those sled dogs, you are literally putting your life in their paws. Okay. Ready? Okay. Hop. <laughs> your name? I'm Stacy. Stacy, have you lived here for a long time? No, I moved here last winter. Really? Where are you from? I'm uh, from Colorado. Oh, What's your name? That's Harley. Harley. And this is Brody. Hey Brody. <laughs> and this is Foxy Man. Did you get them here? Or did uh, you bring... This one I did, these two are from Colorado. It's rescued oh, out of Colorado actually. 
Thanks, Stacy. You guys take care. Well, I don't want to scare anyone from visiting Alaska, but this is the middle of August and it's just a little chilly. Anyhow, I was able to meet with Linda Henning, who is the editor and writer for Alaska Dog News. She gave me some really valuable insights as to what the dogs here participate in and the activities the owners are involved in. So if you take a look at her website, you can learn more. Also, I was able to meet her four dogs and see their unusual behavior. I see a similarity in people that go into competition. And one is a very strong ego. <laughs> and another one is a very strong competitive nature. It really has nothing to do with the dog as far as I've been able to see, but it may, I don't want to say that everybody is like that. I've seen a change in myself once I went from having competitive dogs to pet dogs. It causes physical changes in you, <laughs> the nervousness that makes you can make makes me almost ill sometimes to do that because you're under such scrutiny negative motivation that can be used doesn't is not effective on these dogs at all and they just shut down the reason i think dogs are are, are good at what they do is because they for two reasons they have the drive to do it and they do get enthused by their owners. They can also be hurt by their owners. I know when I was nervous, the dog would get nervous and more jumpy when I was in the field trials. I, I used to think that they could feel my nervousness right down the leash. Daisy's absolutely the star. She's, a, she's absolutely a queen. I had no idea what kind of dog she was. I thought maybe she might be part Great Dane. Do you want it? Sure. Molly's our goofy lab. She's, she's not much into retrieving at all. Lucy would rather retrieve and Molly would rather eat. Lucy, what do you want? His mother is a blonde Saluki and his father is a husky pointer mix. When he runs, he's pretty amazing. Almost scary. <laughs> Your dog. You mind if I videotape them? Do these race in the in the Iditarod? Really? Do they race for anybody specific or? Ray Reddington Jr. What's your What's your name? Reddington. Yeah. Uh, you see the statue over there? Yeah. That's my father. They're a lot thinner looking than what I thought they would be. They're not what people would expect to see the Siberians or Mexicans. Yeah. They're not. They're yeah. what we call Alaska Husky is a mixed breed. Hey guys. How do you keep track of them? We got 60 at home. You got more than this? 60. 60? Wow. My kids each got 62. Wow, that's unreal. The next dog you're going to see coming up gets my award for the most unalaskan looking dog. He's Rachel Payne's miniature Sharpay, and if they were ever going to create a cartoon based on a dog, this would have to be the dog. There was this ad in the paper, and I died. I was like, oh my gosh, he's darling. And my husband's like, saw the price and was like, no way. <laughs> you meet your dog, and it's either meant for you or it's not. And uh, we were, it was love at first sight. We couldn't get enough of each other. He wouldn't get off my lap, and he was such a good boy. You know, he's a lover. Um, Sharpays have a really bad rap for having uh, poor temperaments and being aggressive animals. Once, when he was a puppy, one thing dropped, and ever since then, he's absolutely petrified of big noises. What you doing? I'm gonna get you. I'm gonna get you, you. So we've always had a pet in the house, but I fell in love with the minis. Uh, because they, they tried to breed out all the, the breed issues. They have less skin problems, they have less uh, eye problems, they have less 
of all the issues because they tried to breed them for the better instead of for the worse, and they found out breeding them smaller works. Mm. You're going to go plowing through a field. Come on. And his registered name is Shang Kai Shek's House of Wonton. And I'm like, good Lord. <laughs> and he was, they used to call him Wonton, but he looks like Winnie the Pooh to me. So he thinks everybody's his best friend. And in Anchorage, they have strange little rules requiring you to have a neutered male dog. But your females don't have to be fixed. Which I'm like, that's a double standard for you. <laughs> Such a good quality. We definitely want to make babies, huh? We're going to get you a girlfriend. But it's like having a small child. <laughs> I was like, at least mine's cute and he doesn't talk back to me when he's a teenager. So I'll be okay. Such a good boy, yes you are. What do you want to tell me about him? Well, the Australian Labradoodle uh, was um, bred primarily as a service dog. To do? To assist handicapped people. So they needed to come up with a breed that could be um, have the qualities to act as a service dog, as well as be hypoallergenic to the other member of the family. Well, it seems unavoidable in the course of doing these shows that I'm going to find myself with some what you might call overly protective dogs, and so I go. I think today is the day I am going to get bit. And that sort of was a situation with Matthias Riley and her dogs. She said, here, give them a treat, and I did, but still, oh, I felt uneasy. I don't know why, it's not a reflection upon her, it's a reflection upon me, and I should probably be doing a cat show. <laughs> And he was on death row for being vicious towards people and other dogs. Good boy. And he's one of our management cases. He's about eight years old. Um, like I said, he's traveled the United States more than most people. He's been um, with a man for five years that hitchhiked and train hopped all the way to Alaska from Maine. Patty is very, Patty, very rubbery, very people attentive. She loves people. This is Monkey. He's about 14. He was my first rescue dog and the dog that got me interested in advocating for chain-free care of dogs. Good boy. And he used to growl at men, and as you can see, he's very improved in that. Okay, this is Spider-Man. He's a very large dog and needs a lot of exercise. And actually, he is the one who's convinced me that sometimes two dogs are easier than one. This is Survey, and we adopted him when he was about four months old. He was almost this big, sit, and he was very thin, and uh, was just trouble, as you can imagine. He is the dog that taught me the necessity of exercise for working dogs such as him. He's a husky mix of some kind, lab probably. He loves to swim, and if he doesn't get his exercise every day, he likes to do things like rip the pockets out of my jackets where I had treats before. Yeah. Come on, boy. Pick it up. Pick it up. Trying to come up with an intro for the next piece was just a little bit difficult. You see, it wasn't until I was off camera with Leslie Zacharias that she told me about being a bush pilot and the problem she had being a female in the somewhat male-dominated society here. However, getting through that, we were able to spend some quality time down at the park with her two dogs, Zero and Russia. All right, so now we're in the rain. Now it's raining. Um, when I was flying out in the bush out of King Salmon, Alaska, which is near Bis Bristol Bay, I was living in employee housing, and Zero was uh, tied up 
outside the apartment that we were in and was totally crazy and I actually wasn't sure if he was mean. <laughs> it took me probably a month of coming out there on a regular basis before I was even comfortable enough being within reach of his mouth because I just wasn't sure. Really? He was so odd and his personality was so odd because I think he'd been so isolated for years. I mean, I don't know how many years he was just on that chain. And, and I'd come down and he'd have no water or food for days. You know, I started bringing dog food out. I found out who the owner was and it was this native lady and they had a bunch of kids and dogs and stuff. And she'd found him four years before and just, he was running loose and out in the bush dogs get shot <laughs> pretty regularly. So she just tied him up thinking she was kind of saving him, but then, they don't have a lot of money. It's expensive to live out there, so you know they get fed when there's leftovers off the table, and that was kind of it. And when I first took him inside, he'd never—I don't think he'd ever been in a house, so he was afraid of everything. There was linoleum floor, and he would touch it and jerk his paw back. As winter hit, you know, I mean, he's out there. He had a little hut, like a little dog house, and I mean, it'd be you know minus 40, minus 50, and he's out. So, I mean, his paws, I'm sure, have been frostbitten because he gets cold pretty quick in the winter. The feet, his feet do. He dug himself a pit to go to the bathroom in, so he like he had his own little housekeeping thing. I don't even know how he survived without water because he never had water all winter the whole time I was out there. So, so Russia was abandoned at a gas station in Texas, and she. I guess I got her at, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt or stop my sentence. I, I, I got her as a puppy at four months, and she was actually, she's been one of the more challenging dogs that I have owned. She has a, she had a submissive peeing issue, which anybody that's had a dog that submissive pees understands that this is a major. You can't touch them. People would come over and I'd say, don't touch her. Don't touch her. <laughs> and I'd have to, you know, until she completely calmed down. And then I couldn't have people leaning over her. <laughs> and it was really challenging because when they're submissive peeing, it's not a house training issue. It's, it's, it's an instinctual thing. It's just an indication that they're not dominant. She's definitely the most protective. I think if I was ever in a bear situation, she's the one that would throw her life down for me. Whereas Zero, I think, would just stand behind me. <laughs> And then if I got mauled, he'd run. <laughs> I kind of think that's what you'd do. I'm sorry. You know, there's the dog whisper, and he gets it. Like, he gets dog behavior, and I feel like I'm sort of in a similar boat where I've just always understood how they behaved. And watching what they do and fitting into their world as opposed to forcing them to fit into ours, which I think there's a two totally different mentalities with people training dogs and, and what they expect out, out of them. You know, they're not people, but they're very intelligent. Really, I got this to do this with them because it's just an enjoyable way to travel. Mm. In the summer, you can come down the coastal trail and I can go out to coffee and they get exercise and I just get a nice ride down the trail. Well, this is Greg in Alaska. Thanks for watching the show. Hope to see you soon again in another episode of the Dog Soup. Let's go. Come on. Let's go. Come on. That way. Let's go. You're going the wrong way. That way. These are known as bear bells. You hook them up to your backpack or your jacket and they're supposed to scare off the bear, I guess. Yeah.
Take it down.